next uh, up is a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy, short and long-term outcomes of intracorporeal versus extracorporeal anastomosis. It'll be presented by Dr. Mark Hanna from UC Irvine. Good afternoon. Um, sorry. Uh, my name is Mark Hanna. I'm a fourth year general surgery resident at UCI. I want to thank the society for the privilege of allowing us to present our work today. We have no financial disclosures, no conflict of interest, and no funding was received for this study. Laparoscopic uh, colectomy or colorectal resection has been gaining popularity over the past decade. Uh, this is because of mounting evidence for lower complications, faster recovery, and shorter hospital stay. Um, there's also mounting evidence uh, suggesting that the laparoscopic colorectal resection actually has um, equivalent oncologic outcomes with open resection. Um, we wanted to study our own institutional experience with laparoscopic right hemicolectomy. As uh, most of you know, um, there are two ways to construct an anastomosis during a procedure like this. Uh, one uh, technique involves laparoscopic assisted extracorporeal anastomosis, and the other one involves a totally laparoscopic intracorporeal maturation of the anastomosis. Our study had three main objectives. We wanted to assess the feasibility of intracorporeal anastomosis during a laparoscopic right uh, colectomy uh, in our practice. We wanted to compare the postoperative outcomes between intracorporeal and extracorporeal anastomoses. And uh, third, uh, we wanted to elucidate the short and long-term oncologic outcomes um, using these techniques uh, for colon cancer patients. Our study was approved by the IRB board at UCI. It involved a retrospective chart review of 195 consecutive cases of laparoscopic right colectomies. These were performed by four colorectal surgeons. Um, this was done at three tertiary teaching urban hospitals and spanned a decade of experience from March 2005 up to June of the 2014. Cases were divided into those that were performed totally laparoscopically uh, with an intracorporeal anastomosis and a laparoscopic assisted extracorporeal anastomosis maturation. Um, surgical technique was standardized between the two cohorts, so all patients underwent a standard medial to lateral dissection uh, laparoscopically. The extracorporeal anastomoses were matured uh, by an extension of one of the existing port sites, most commonly the midline incision. Then we proceeded with a stapled side-to-side anti-peristaltic anastomosis. And finally, uh, enteronomies were closed using two-layer running vicral sutures. In comparison, the intracorporeal anastomoses were kind of performed uh, with a similar technique, but done laparoscopically, so a stapled side-to-side anti-peristaltic anastomosis. Um, then the enteronomies were closed using a two-layer running uh, vicral uh, sutures that were done laparoscopically. And finally, the specimen was extracted, most commonly using a fan steel incision. Our primary endpoints of the study were defined as length of stay and risk of anastomotic leak. Secondary endpoints were, that were evaluated were return of bowel function, risk of intra-abdominal abscess, risk of wound complications, and we also did a subset analysis of the cancer patients looking at overall survival and disease-free survival. Um, statistical significance was defined as a p-value less than 0.05. We also performed a multivariate analysis comparing intracorporeal and extracorporeal anastomoses while controlling for confounding variables. All cases with uh, fec fecal diversion were excluded from the anastomotic leak analysis. Looking at our results, uh, we had a total cohort of 195 cases. 44% uh, uh, underwent an intracorporeal anastomosis and 56% underwent an extracorporeal anastomosis. Among the intracorporeal group, uh, the majority of cases, about 80%, were, due, uh, were done for a diagnosis of a neoplasm, whereas among the extracorporeal group, again, the most common indication was a neoplasm, but the ratio was less at 65%. Looking at the specific indications, uh, focusing on the extracorporeal uh, anastomosis cohort, the most common indication was cancer in 52% of uh, the patients. The second most common indication was actually IBD, and this represented about 30% of all the cases. Uh, when you contrast this with the intracorporeal cohort, where the most common indication was again cancer in 72% of the cases, but the second most common indication was actually a benign adenoma. Um, looking at the trends in operative uh, duration, uh, we saw a steady improvement in the operative time um, from the beginning of the study to the end. So the mean average operative time was actually 240 minutes. 
um, in the first year of the analysis, and that actually decreased to 170 minutes by the last year of the analysis. So all of our surgeons, all four surgeons, improved by an average of one hour in terms of case duration looking at the intercorporeal anastomosis. Looking at the unadjusted outcomes, operative time um, in terms of median operative time was similar between the two cohorts. Again, EBL was also uh, similar between the two cohorts. A length of stay was um, also, also similar at around five days um, on average. And um, we did see a trend towards a uh, faster recovery or faster return to regular diet with the intercorporeal cohort by one day. However, this was not statistically significant. What was interesting in our analysis was the conversion rate where we saw 10 conversions in the extracorporeal group that accounted for a conversion rate of 9%. This contrasted with the intracorporeal uh, cohort where all cases were actually completed laparoscopically. I should mention here that the comorbidity scores were higher in the extracorporeal group and that might explain these findings. In terms of complications, the rate of anastomotic leak trended to be higher in the extracorporeal group at 4.6%, uh, which was about four times higher than in the intercorporeal group. Uh, inter the incidence of intraabdominal uh, abscess was similar. The incidence of ileus and bowel obstruction was actually surprisingly higher in the intercorporeal group. This again uh, trended to be uh, among the patients who were treated earlier in the, in the study. In terms of incidence of wound complications, surprisingly, we had a higher incidence, sorry, we had a higher incidence in the um, intercorporeal group uh, that trended amongst the earlier patients in the study. And finally, a composite score of all complications was similar between the two cohorts. In terms of uh, the adjusted multivariate analysis, we did not find any statistical difference in terms of the rate of anastomotic leak, even though there was a strong trend towards uh, less leaks with intercorporeal anastomoses. Uh, in terms of the adjusted analysis of length of stay, there was no significant difference between the two modalities. Um, there was a trend towards uh, faster return to regular diet with intercorporeal anastomosis. Unfortunately, none of these endpoints reach statistical significance. In terms of oncologic outcomes, the most common uh, stage of disease uh, for patients was stage three disease, which was the majority in both cohorts. Looking at the median number of lymph nodes harvested between the two groups, there was no statistical significance, and there were 19 and 18 lymph nodes each. And recurrence was similar between the two groups. Finally, looking at overall survival, again, there was no st significant difference between the two uh, groups. And looking at disease -free, free, free, sorry, disease free survival, there was no difference between the two groups. Uh, our study is limited by the fact that it's a retrospective observational study, therefore it can only uh, establish associations. This is one of the largest reported series so far of intercorporeal anastomoses. However, it's a still a, pa a small patient cohort, and we were not able to achieve statistical significance in our study. There is an inherent patient and selection bias um, that is obvious in this case. In conclusion, we uh, found that laparoscopic intercorporeal anastomosis for uh, right hemicolectomies is safe and feasible with similar post-operative and uh, oncologic outcomes. It does have some uh, potential benefits, such as expanded locations of specimen extraction sites, smaller incisions, possibly prevention of bowel misalignment um, and twisting of the mesentery, and maybe technically easier in morbidly obese patients. Thank you. So we'll open up for uh, questions. Uh, as we do, there were two questions that came in. Um, how was the technique chosen by the surgeon? And uh, in obese people, was there a difference? The, pr uh, the uh, person wants to know. So um, this was a cumulative experience over 10 years. Um, we uh, initially started only using it sparingly as our surgeons became more comfortable with the actual intracorporeal technique. So I would say it was used very selectively early on and then became more common. And to be, uh, now, in the past few years, I would say it's the preferred technique in, that is done by most of our uh, four practicing colorectal surgeons. Um, in terms of the second question, there was a trend towards better outcomes uh, in morbidly obese patients. Unfortunately, this was not statistically significant. Uh, from our uh, own experience, we found it technically easier sometimes to do an intercorporeal anastomosis in somebody who's morbidly obese, who has a very shortened mesentery and a very thick abdominal wall. So there are some technical advantages that we, we perceive uh, are there. Okay, good. Thank you. We have a question on the floor. Uh, Barry Salke, New York, uh, Mount Sinai. 
Uh, I love the paper because I'm a big fan of intracorporeal anastomosis. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, number one, if you fed the patients by the third and fourth day, why were they discharged on the fifth day? What was the extra day about? Simple question. Uh, and number two, um, knowing the propensity for the use of the robot at your institution, uh, was there, were there any uh, non-robotic intracorporeal anastomoses? And if they were, were they compared to the robotic ones? And the third quick question is, was there a difference in post-op hernia formation in the midline incision versus the fan and still extraction sites? Thank you, I enjoyed it, thank you very much. Thanks for your questions. Um, in terms of the first question, um, the increased length of stay was seen earlier in the, in the study period. Um, in the later half of our experience, we've now used enhanced recovery programs, and it seems that actually has allowed us to catch up with discharging patients on time when they are uh, on their regular diet. Um, in terms of the robotic question, uh, this was a purely laparoscopic experience, so none of these uh, anastomoses actually involved uh, robotic maturation. Um, uh, and sorry, I forgot the third question. It's okay, we're gonna move on. Mo Molly, you wanna ask me? Oh, sorry, incisional hernia. So that's okay, actually an right. excellent point because we do feel that there's an advantage in the fenestiel uh, incision. We've, uh, and this is, we haven't really looked at this in detail, but just from a, our own experience, there's been about four or five hernias that were all in the extracorporeal group. We have not seen any hernias using the fenestiel incision, so there might be an advantage there. Good, thank you very much. Thank you.